Sorry, Kevin. Welcome to the Funky Pot Mindful Media and Communication. And I simply assume when you look at today's, today's topic, you think, I did not see that coming. <laughs> Sorry, I'm German. I have to make jokes about it. Otherwise, I cannot cope with our history. So today, as you see, we're talking about something serious well let, 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 let's see let's let's see so first of all welcome back if you're like a returning listener welcome for the first time if you're a first time listener um today the funky pot is your auditory oasis in the desert of grab of of trap dialogues why well I don't, I don't, I'm trying to find a smooth entrance, but it's just not working. So let me just roll back the clock a little bit today to a time when, when viral meant something very, very different to today. And we're talking about the Nazi Germany, and yes, I'm German, uh, and how media strategy right, turned like a fractured country into a whale old machine. Of the worst kind, obviously. The strap in, it's going to be an, informate, an informative ride, I hope, with some twists in the end. Let's see. So, let's start with the obvious things that most people know, right? So, the propaganda machine, right? Let's, let's do it. So, the guy who could have given, would have given, like, Madison Avenue a run for its money, Josef Goebbels, and yes, that's how you pronounce it, okay? So, at least you're learning how to pronounce all those dudes today. So, he was the propaganda prodigy, right? He didn't just disseminate messages, like he engineered like an entire new reality. Okay, he cooked up most of the messaging that Nazi Germany was using. And one of the theories that, that they used, of course, is the hypodermic needle theory, right? The theory suggests that media could inject ideas and messages directly into the passive audience's minds. Okay, because you're just exposed to that media the whole time. So the media is sending the messages to you and you're like, okay, okay, you're just consuming it, okay? So Goebbels' strategy was to flood the nation with the same messages across all media, okay? Radio, film, press, public events, you name it, the same messages kept getting sent over and over and over and over again. If you expose it all the time and you don't have anyone to talk about it or to criticize it, Yeah, so then eventually you're like, okay, well, okay, you're giving in eventually, not, not actively, but passively, right? Because the audience, of course, very, very, very passive back in the day. Yeah, here's an example. In yeah, 1936, the Olympic Games were in Berlin, okay? And it was a showcase not just of athletic prowess, of course, but of, of a regime's might, right? That's why they did it. Like, and you might know Leni Riefenstahl, and, and she had the, the, the movie, right, called Olympia that you can still watch. So it was a spectacle designed to impress one, but also to intimidate. It's broadcasted to the world. Look at how strong we are. Look at how well-oiled, well-organized Germany is. Okay. If you fast forward now to, to today's influencers, right, who, who like peddle everything from politics to protein powder, right? Um, hey, James Smith, PT. No, I'm kidding. It's the only PT I follow, actually. Uh, they may not be like pushing obviously totalitarianism but the method repetition emotion simplicity it's eerily similar okay so yeah Goebbels did all that and yes the Nazis have been defeated luckily but the way they use the media is still here okay and we're still exposed to it and that's why we have this episode today okay You could say like the nation was under, under influence, if you will, right? Because even if you talk about things like the cinema, right? Like Hollywood had like its golden age. Germany was pro producing its own hits, okay? Albeit with like a more, more sinister plotline, obviously. Like this film's often portrayed like an idolized version of German life, glorifying like the Aryan race and of course demonizing the others, especially the Jews, Right? And here you can see that the cultivation theory right, posits that long-term exposure to media can and will shape our perception of reality. Okay, so if you all saw where, where movies that like depicted like a certain group as heroes and another as villains, your worldview would shift accordingly eventually. Okay, so compare that to like the binge watching culture of, of today. We may not have like state sponsored narratives, <coughs> may, but, but algorithms often dictate like a similar narrow view of the world, 
reinforcing our biases with every single click. Right. Let's think about it. Okay. I also, I just realized that I, I, I watched like a UFC event the other day and then the advertising in between was like very like getting you ready to find your right injection. I, I don't want to say that word, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get canceled. Um, but so it's also like a narrative, like what kind of advertising do you see, for example? Uh, very interesting. And that, that leads me to, to the echo chamber effect, right? So the Nazis, of course, they were masters of, of, of the echo chamber, right? Like radios were sold super cheaply. Why? To ensure that Hitler's speeches and the Nazi news reached every single ear. Okay, so that's why radios were so cheap. There was no escaping the message. Like it echoed like from every home, every pub, every workplace. Turn on the radio, hear Hitler speak. Very smart. And here, this is what we call selective exposure theory, okay? So people favor information, of course, that confirms their pre-existing beliefs. And the Nazis made sure that only available information, that it only the available information that supported their narrative was sent to the people. So of course, and everyone would agree with the Nazi philosophy because you hear it all the time, right? Today, our social media feed, right, mimics this effect. And we follow those that we agree with, let's be honest, block those that we don't agree with, this creates this echo chamber. Again, we might not have state-controlled media, right? But when, when was the last time you checked the sources of your newsfeed? Probably never. Hmm. So it's actually worse than state-sponsored me or state-controlled media because we give it in like willingly. We're not even forced. We're just giving in willingly. And this leads me to the, to the then versus now, okay? So let, let's, let's connect the dots, okay? So could the insidious media st strategies of the 1930s and 40s find a place in our digital age? the question. Unfortunately, the playbook isn't that outdated. Yes, it's been like almost 100 years, but while the costumes have changed, the actors have changed, the script, not so much, and that's frustrating. Yeah, consider another one. They use gratification theory. We talked about it so many times, right? We use media for different reasons. Escapism, validation, identity formation, and so on, right? The Nazis use this to their advantage, providing a sense of, of belonging and purpose through the media. You're like, oh, yeah, they're like me. I want to be like them. That's so cool. Oh, yeah, awesome. Let's follow them. That sounds fantastic. They look so pretty, and so on. And isn't that what modern-day platforms do? Isn't that that's exactly what modern-day platforms do? Yeah, tailor content to our desires, often amplifying like, like the sensational, the, the divisive, right? Either showing you what's super mega awesome or like pick sides right now, right? But that's exactly what the platforms do. It's like the battle for our attention. Every click, like, and share is a vote for the world we want to see. Yeah, collecting data, making our echo chamber better in a sense that it echoes more of what we apparently want. So we see a resurgence of like nationalist ideologies right now. Okay, we see a spread of fake news right now. We see democratic governments playing the tune of control and misinformation right now. Okay, it's not just about one country or one regime. It's a global issue. It's it's a human issue. And we need to be aware of that. You see how that gets me riled up? It's, because it's so obvious. So tell people about it. I sound like Russell Brand again. Uh, okay, I'm almost there. But I want to give you a few more, a few more uh, things to think of um, before leaving, okay? Because there are a few more insidious chapters that I didn't, didn't touch on yet, and I'm just going to quickly leave a few thoughts with you, a few facts that you can think of, okay, from, from the Nazi media playbook. So the, the regime's control, right, extend far beyond just propaganda film and, and radio broadcasts. That's, that's not all it did, right? They reached into, like, the everyday life of citizens. You know, they're crafting, like, narratives that, that permeated even the most innocent of mediums. What do, what do I mean? Well... Take children's board games, for example. Yes, you heard it right. Board games. There was a board game called Juden Raus, means juice out, 
that had players chase wooden figures representing Jews out of walled medieval German cities. And you think mon Monopoly causes family disputes just. Uh, there are others where you had to bomb like cities in, in, in England, for example. Yeah, so that's one, like board games was something that they used. Now think of maybe not necessarily board games, even though they, they have some form of resurgence too, but other kind of games are some are big these days, right? Yeah. Then there was art. Yeah, art meant to inspire and provoke thought. But under the Nazis, became like a tool to shape ideology. The Hitler Youth, for example, the Hitler Jugend in German, and schools were like awash. A like, you know, Hitler wanted to be an artist. They were awash with like imagery and, and activities designed to mold the Aryan leaders of tomorrow, not exposing them actively to like that new form of modern art. Modernist art was like not well liked in, in Nazi Germany. It was hated. In fact, it was like collected and thrown away, sold off, burned and, and, and so on. Okay, so... Yeah, ah, so we have board games, we have art. Is it also happening right now? Huh. And I have one more thing, that then, then I'll let you go before we get to that. Censorship. Of course, the Nazi regime like, was the ultimate critic, obviously, deciding which books were bestsellers and which were kindling bonfires. Like. The message was clear, fall in line, or your words go up in smoke. Now, these days, we don't see... The burning of books, I believe, at least not on a large scale. But are all books available everywhere? Exactly. So you see, yeah, the Nazis were defeated, luckily. But their playbook of how to control the people made it into every country in the world. So we have to be aware of like, seeing like, who uses those plays. And when they're being used on us all the time. And hopefully this awareness leads us to being able to counter it. Okay. So I'm about to close this, this session of, of the Funk Report right now. But yeah, let's remind ourselves that the power that the media holds, of the power that the media holds. Okay. It's like a, we talked about it all the time. It's a double-edged sword that can defend democracy or, or undermine it. Right. In our hands lies the power to choose, to question and to change the channel, we just have to do it. So as always, I hope you learned something. I hope you continue to stay curious, stay critical, very important what we learned. Yeah, stay vigilant, like because in a world where, where attention is currency, yeah, invest views wisely, yeah, challenge your views, diversify your sources, don't be stuck in your echo chamber. And maybe, yeah, just maybe we'll keep history firmly where it belongs in the past. So thank you, as always, for joining me on this, this, this journey. Uh, if you liked what you heard, or if you disliked what you heard, but if you found it interesting, uh, share it, like, subscribe, leave a review, it would be fantastic. And yeah, stay mindful. And yeah, stay safe, take care. We talk soon. Somebody.